every year on the 11th of April I relive this because it was a very traumatic time. Some security guy came up to me and says, well, uh, what are you doing here? Are you trafficking people? <laughs> Viewers and listeners, Assalamu Alaikum and welcome to another episode of Side by Side. Our guest today is none other than the one and only Barrister Rizwan Hussein, who is a Bangladeshi TV presenter, actor, a philanthropist, a barrister. I was then taken to another isolated room and that's where the beating uh, actually happened. I had to be emergency flown out by the British Embassy. No way. And then my father actually passed away 28 days later. I was unable to attend his janaza even for security reasons. Marriage with Nadia Ali, the BBC presenter. Whose fault uh, was it? Then it would it would be that. Wow. So, do you know Shahid Falahi? I know Shahid Falahi. So I had I had him come to my house, you know, try and teach me some 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 techniques. But it's right. like my daughter and my. Uh, son can they can do it better than me it's probably because they go to school and you know the school teaches well, them in look, a certain my view is i think everybody can sing everybody can sing whether it sounds good to the ear or not it's a different thing altogether but everybody uh, can sing i mean i would never say nobody can sing you know uh, you either sing well or you don't sing well uh, you know timing uh, is something i had a problem with timing all my albums had to be synchronized and wow so, so, Brother Rizan, Rizwan, yeah. Barrister, I must say, Barrister Rizwan Hussain, welcome to Side by Side. Now, obviously, we have been, we kind of made a head start while the studio was getting ready, but uh, it's all good, kind of, it kind of brings us um, to the show quite nicely. Take us back in time. So, before the show, you said um, you are 50. Yes, I turned My 50. God, I can't believe I, I thought we were kind of the same age. And no, I was comparing myself with you. And then you're saying, am I, am I older or are you older? <laughs> well, there, there, there is a story behind that. I mean, um, officially, I turned 50 last December, December 23. I was born in 1973. I say officially. Um, um, ironically, in my, own fa in my family, I have two older brothers, two younger sisters. I'm the only one born in Bangladesh. I'm the middle child, but born in Bangladesh, which is okay. a, bit, it's a bit odd because both of my, uh, my elder brothers were born in the UK. Uh, and the story behind that was that my parents were visiting Bangladesh at that time. Uh, and for some reason, they couldn't travel back in time to the UK. And I was born in Bangladesh. Now, I remember, remember I said officially, yeah, I was actually born in 74. Okay. Uh, so um, what happened after I was born, I was uh, quite unwell, quite seriously unwell, and they needed to bring me back to the UK. Back in those days, there wasn't British Airways. There was a, f a flight called British Caledonian Airways. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, and they had a rule that you could only take a child on board if the child was one year old. Wow. Yeah, so they had to change my birth certificate um, to December 1973, so that I could actually board the flight. So, um, in reality, I'm pr I'm about officially seven months older than I actually should be. I was actually born in July 74, but on my passport it says December 73. So, like the Queen, I, I have two birthdays. Wow, wow. So, so, what are you? Are you 49 or 50? Well, if I was to talk about when I'm going to get my pension, then I'm 50. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I actually become 50 July of this year. Yeah, so. But still, my God, like, you know, what, what do you do? Do you exercise or do you, do you eat certain things? You know, share, share the secrets, man. I think having a stress-free life is probably the main ingredient of it. But, but generally speaking, uh, I don't know, maybe it's, it's genetics as well. And my brothers uh, look younger than me, so... It's just one of those things. But I do believe that it's suddenly going to catch up. And then you'll probably see me in a few years' time and you'll say, oh my goodness, what happened to you? So, so how are you now? Any any concerns, any health concerns? Or are you kind of all clear? No, alhamdulillah. Um, I actually, you know, I don't suffer from diabetes or any other um, kind of illnesses in, that associate with age. The only thing I noticed that um, from, from childhood, I used to be... Uh, hyper long sighted, not just long sighted, but you can see from a long distance. Um, but when you hit 50, these become permanent. So uh, 
I could, I could tell that was coming on because as soon as it did, I can't read close up anymore. So if you send me a WhatsApp and I'm not wearing my glasses, I won't be able to read what you've actually written. Wow. So, so you, you, some, you, you finally made it to the UK. Yes. Bangladeshi yeah. born. Yeah. Um, what was life like in England? Where were you staying? Well, I, I grew up in a very quaint little place called Loughborough in, in Leicestershire. Um, and it was such a small place and such a, so few Bengalis that literally we could name every person that lived in the town and their siblings, literally. So everybody knew how many brothers and sisters they had and their names as, as we grew up. Uh, so I remember everybody went to the same primary school. Um, we were all kind of, there were only about three generations, well, three age groups rather, um, uh, so my brothers was my brother was from the eldest group, middle brother from the second, and me from the third group. So growing up in a in a very small town, it was a very very different experience from what I hear of children growing up uh, in London. And I'll, I'll be I'll be quite frank, we never ever um, experienced what racism is growing up in a town that had such a small Muslim and Bangladeshi population. Never, never in my childhood. Uh, in addition to that, um, I remember when I went to uh, to college to do uh, to A levels. Uh, I was the only brown skinned child in the whole college. So, from that, when you come to London, when you've got entire schools that are Bangladeshi or, or Muslim, it's a very uh, contrasting situation to w- w- where I grew up. So, one could say I had a very kind of a a, a kind of dual cultured upbringing. Because we grew up in a place that was predominantly white, uh, but it was also a very tight knit community, and in that small town they established a mosque. Um, it's going to be fifty years next year, fifty wow. years ago. Mashallah. Yeah. So, as part of my research, I have found that your dad, your father, was in the British Army. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, uh, to, to clarify that a bit further, of course, my father was born when. Bangladesh was a part of India, so well before 1947. So he was a part of the Royal, uh, the Royal Indian Army, Royal being the British mm-hmm. Royal Indian Army, uh, which he had joined. Uh, and then, of course, um, India then got split up to India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So my dad had a, an Indian passport. Uh, he had a, a Pakistani passport and then a Bangladeshi passport, and then uh, obviously he uh, became British uh, when he arrived here. So, so how, what was life like for him? Because a lot of people, they came, you know, through migration, you know, what we call migration, but did he come as part of a royal thing or, or because he served in the army, it was easy for him? What was it like? Um, did he ever um, share those experiences? Yeah, my dad, uh, I believe, arrived in the 60s. Um, and... Uh, when he arrived, uh, as far as I recall, he was uh, in his uniform uh, when he arrived. Uh, that uniform actually got stolen because um, he'd washed it and uh, put it out in the garden for drying and then it got stolen. <laughs> so that, that's the story uh, behind that one. And my first memories is, is that he has three medals. He's got the two Burma stars <coughs> and King George the the Eighth or King George V uh, medal that... Um, I inherited after uh, uh, after his death, and I remember he used to say that I he met uh, Elizabeth's father, Queen Elizabeth's father, uh, when he had uh, come to the UK. And ironically, what well, my my father was very much of a royalist, in, in the sense that he used to refer to uh, King Charles like a son, and Princess Diana as uh, as um, you know Tilibu. Mm. As, a, as, as a daughter, daughter in law, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that that's my earliest memories. He was very much of a of a royalist, very fond of the royal family. Uh, but when he did arrive, I remember his salary used to be seven pounds a week. So, what was his job? He was working. Um, I don't know whether you know Loughborough is quite famous for uh, building trains. The Eurostar was actually built in oh. in, in Loughborough. So, there's there's some kind of um, engineering works in Loughborough uh, that used to build trains and park trains, and he worked in 
in that factory when he first arrived. Did you ever have any issues with the fact that your father worked in the army or served in the army or he was a royalist? You know, you know how we have now like um, a sentiment where if you kind of support the royals or if you have any sentiment towards royals, then you're kind of a sellout. What was what was it like back then? I think, you know, with, with my father, when you've actually lived in uh, or lived through the evolution of three countries, British India, which then became India, <clears throat> and then we were a part of Pakistan, and then we were a part of Bangladesh, um, I, I think all in all, because he grew up in, uh, uh, he was born in British India, grew up as a British uh, Indian, so I think all in all, he was probably British from a very, very young age. So that's the, certainly the way he came across. So <clears throat> so his his journey, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, then Brit, um, Britain. Then, then, yeah. How did it look like? Did he live somewhere in geo, geo kind of location wise? Did he live in a certain place that kind of touched on all these areas or what did it look like? I think um, uh, obviously when he, when he was in the army, he, he most likely traveled uh, the subcontinent a little bit. I remember him talking about being in Burma um, because he fought as a part of the, uh, the, the Burmese team uh, down there. That's where he earned his Burma stars. Uh, but it actually did take him around much of Bangladesh and what was Assam uh, at that okay, time yes. as well. Because Bangladesh, of course, wasn't border defined yeah. uh, at that time. Um, so there was a foray into I India and Burma on this side as well. Um, so yeah, for, for him, I think um, Bangladesh is something that came much, much later uh, in his life. Much, much later. Wow. So... Then what are your thoughts <laughs> on, well, on, on being a royalist? Or Is your father still ar around? Uh, no, or? my father passed away in 2008. In early, yeah. um, well, look, I, I think part of what I've inherited is that I always say to people that, look, borders were drawn by human beings. The whole of the uh, Southeast Asian continent, if you travel from uh, one end of India to, uh, to Bangladesh, for example, in one end you've got the run of Kutch and uh, you've got Gujarat, uh, to the left, and then if you travel all the way across uh, to Bangladesh, all you will notice is similarity. Yeah. yeah. There are so many thousands of languages spoken on that subcontinent. Uh, that's the only difference you'll pick up. Otherwise, we're all very, very similar. I was actually in, um, in Karachi only 10 days ago. I, I was doing some filming in Karachi. And what struck me is uh, how similar, you know, uh, the, the the streets of Karachi, the buildings, the people, the food, you know, it, it surprises me that there had to be so many different borders that had to be created uh, over the years because in many senses we're all very, very similar. So where do you stand in terms of being a royalist? Where do I stand? Look, I'm, uh, I, I like the pomp of, of okay. the family, yeah? Um, I, I must say I did sit through the whole uh, coronation um, and, but uh, other than that, I think, you know, um, if we go back to, to the old ages to be uh, for a, a non-democratic kind of kingdom, I don't think it would work uh, today. But I, I like the, the whole um, uh, kind of the pomp and the celebration. About uh, aside family. from the celebration, celebratory kind of their kind of um, setups and, and, you know, it's, it's amazing how they kind of keep that going even till today, the tradition, the clothing, I'm, I'm the culture. I'm very much a traditionalist. Yes. Very much a traditionalist. But from so. a political point of view, like, what's your views? Aside from all the good stuff, I'm sure the British have a lot to offer and they have offered so much. Uh, one thing that stands out to me is administration, how they administer anything, whether it's a school, college, university, country. It's, it's, it's really kind of well thought through, but... Also, they have a certain side to them, which is the, the kind of the impacts we see in, in, in Palestine, Gaza, you know, the India, uh, the, the borders, you know, how they drew the kind of um, the borders between India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you know, yes. it's kind of so. Well, I, I can see how we as Bangladeshis were, uh, would be very, very serious on the Gaza issue because Bangladesh was also at a point an occupied land. Yeah? 
If you look at the, the, the history of British colonialism, there was a lot of occupation. There was a lot of bad history, so to speak, without going into too much details. Uh, if, you, <coughs> if you travel to uh, the <coughs> United States, Canada, and if you look at some of the history, it is very, very ugly history of occupation, uh, of ethnic cleansing. Uh, and unfortunately, what we're witnessing now, uh, perhaps it, it, it's getting a lot of social media attention, a lot of attention, because it is known to people now. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, when such happened in, in, in Central and North America, it was unheard of. Nobody knew about it. So from being a Bangladesh's point of view, of course, we, uh, we, our sentiments will be even stronger. Um, I'm very. What, I, what does surprise me uh, is how the same sentiment isn't shared in in mainland India. They went through something similar for two hundred years, uh, yet they're very very quiet on this uh, Gaza issue. Okay, so you moved to the UK. You went to school. You were the only Bangladeshi boy in your school or or, or class. Um, doing A levels, I was the only Bangladeshi at the time. What did you feel like? Uh, that must have been kind of, for me, if, if that was me, it would feel kind of very awkward. Uh, what did it feel? Well, they would know if I wasn't in college because I, was okay. I was easy to spot first thing uh, in the day, whether I was in the college or not. <coughs> but to be honest, I don't think I've, it felt any different. For, to me, it's, it, it was normal because I hadn't known anything different from that. So if, for example, I'd, uh, been, uh, I grew up in London where I'd been in school where that was... 90% one of the students, and then moved to a, a place like Loughborough, of course it would be a bit of a culture shock. But for me, it was absolutely normal. And I don't think I was treated any differently. In fact, there was a lot of eagerness to learn about the Bangladeshi culture. There was a lot of eagerness to learn about the Islamic culture from us. Um, and we were given the opportunity to actually talk about uh, our culture and our religion, perhaps more freely uh, in that situation than would be in a different situation. And then you went on to do A-levels, and then from A-levels you decided to study law. I mean, is that something that because everyone else was doing it, or, or is something that you were quite passionate about? Why did you pick that subject? Well, to be honest, if I was able to turn back history, I probably would not have studied law. Okay, uh, Let me explain why that happened. My father uh, obviously... Um, uh, came to this country, and obviously, like many other fathers that came to this country in the 60s, they struggled, they worked hard to build a life for themselves, and they wanted to see their children to become educated uh, and to get good jobs. So I remember my father, while we were still very young, I must have been only five or six, when I first heard the word barrister uh, being talked about. Uh, and my father, he, he, he told my older brother, who's only two years older than me, I want you to become a doctor. And mashallah, that's what happened. He became a, a doctor. To my middle brother, he said, I want you to become an engineer. Um, and then he, he said to me, I want you to be a barrister. Obviously, I had no clue what a barrister was, other than uh, maybe later on when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, I used to see uh, lawyers in TV dramas. and I'd be told that's what a barrister is. The fact that they wear a wig, uh, and the gown. And it was kind of embedded into me from that very early age that I was going to become a barrister. So as far as I, I was concerned, I, from that point, I became very tunnel visioned um, that this is what I have to do. My father wants me to become a barrister. So I went and did the law degree. Immediately after the law degree, I did the, the bar course in 1996 at the Inns of Court School of Law. And that was it. So by by 21, the academic side of it was over. It was finished. 22, actually. So, barrister at 22. That's correct, yeah. The academic um, study side of it was completed at that point. And I think at that point, I probably came out thinking, right, what, what do I do now? Because um, although I did uh, practice in law for, uh, for some time after that, it w um, I started to look at things that interested me more. And I think the first thing that I looked at was music. I'd uh, taken a, a liking towards um, producing music, writing music, and, and singing, 
although I've, I'm not the best of singers, you know, uh, I, I admit that openly, but I learned the trade and the marketing. And um, within a few years, I think I was the only British Bangladeshi to be in the, uh, what used to be known as the Net Asia charts uh, in the UK to reach number two. Uh, with, what was the track name? It was called Jan, the source of my life. So, wow. And was that was that song or track inspired by anything? Um, it was, actually. <laughs> Ironically, uh, I, I, I won't be the first to admit that I ripped the song from somewhere else, uh, but changed it significantly. It was actually inspired by the song by Bee Gees uh, called Words and Words Are All I Have, which I then rewrote in Hindi and changed it slightly. But it was... Uh, it was a, a slow romantic number back in 1999. So generally, what what I found was with with musicians, there's always a story behind each songs. Yes. What was your story? I mean, what was the driving force or the fuel behind that song? Was there anything that was kind of behind that song that you wanted to maybe perhaps convey a message to someone or some people? What was it? Well, you see, when I, when I first started out in music, everybody wants to be somebody, right? So I wanted to be Muhammad Rafi. Now, being Muhammad Rafi is wanting to be the best musician that perhaps Southeast Asia has had in, in the last few centuries. So I made the big mistake of going to, uh, recording a cover of a Muhammad Rafi song. And obviously, when you're going to record a cover of somebody else's song, you're either going to be better or you've got to be to a reasonable standard. It was an absolute debacle. Uh, I remember there was a newspaper back in the days, I think they, they still do exist, maybe online, Eastern Eye. Uh, I don't know whether you remember. Yes, I, I remember uh, Eastern, Eastern Eye. Eye. And Eastern Eye w- wrote a very damning review uh, of that song when it came out, uh, to the point that they said that Rizwan Hassan doesn't know the R in Rafi, let alone being able to sing this song. So that was the first feedback I had in a kind was of was that kind of insp- I mean um, was it racist or, or or was it just being a critique? I, th- or? I think it was probably the most honest review okay. that somebody gave, and I'm grateful for that because that honest review didn't set me back. Um, I thought to myself, okay, fair enough, it was a bad product, but that's not the end of. Sometimes a, a, a failure helps you get to the next step. So. I remember then approaching a, a music company that at that time uh, was the, the number one Asian music label. Uh, it was called Roma Music Bank, RMB. And it had signed all the top artists of that time. And I went to see the owner. He listened to it. He said, look, if you're going to do covers, and I agree with the review, this is terrible. Please don't play this anywhere ever again. You know, rip up the tape, and it was tapes in those days, cassettes. You know, rip it up and throw it in the bin. It's awful. He said, look, if you want to succeed, go away and do the, do the, the hard work. The hard work is write a song yourself, compose it yourself, record something original, and then come back to me. If you're good enough, I will sign you. So I remember going away, uh, not feeling disheartened, but rather thinking, okay, if I'm going to be serious about this music career, I need to do that. So I remember going away, um, and in the process of writing music, you listen to a lot. So I listened to various things, and that particular song by Bee Gees was uh, one of my English favorites uh, at the time. And I started writing, and I thought, yeah, I can do this. I don't want to do a straight copy, but I want to take the general melody uh, and change the words to make it a bit more meaningful, etc. And I remember completing the song while I was in a traffic jam on the M6 motorway just jotting down on a piece of paper during the last few lines. And I finished it, and I then called uh, my studio manager at that time, Michael, and I said, Michael, I think I've got the song I want to record. Can we record now? He says, well, where are you? I said, no, I'm on the M6. Well, he said, drive over to Walsall and let's record it. So I went straight to the studio, and that song that you've probably heard, John, already, it was recorded in one single take. Wow. Yeah. In one single take. Literally, I'd recorded the whole song in three minutes, 54 seconds. There was, no, there was not a second take or anything. And then obviously they add the music and all of that. Um, and the next day I went to see the owner of Roma Music Bank. Um, 
he listened to it once and said, right, I'm signing you. I'm signing you for a single and an album. And back then, to be signed to the, the top music label at that time was, was major because you were automatically signed to the labels of the biggest artists. So uh, back at time. home, <laughs> what's, what's the sentiment at home? Uh, because you're, yes. you're kind of going on another track and then yeah. there's another subject I want to talk, uh, talk about, which is your life as a police officer. What was the reaction at home? Like my son, you know, we, we've, we've had huge aspirations for him and now he's gone to music. <clears throat> I think one of the things I'm probably most grateful for from, from my parents that they were never overly critical, you know, uh, and never in, in my exploration of different things did they uh, put a barrier. Because I think in their own mind they knew that, look, he, he did what we asked him to do. He went on and did his law degree, completed the bar. So if he wants to explore a few other things, let him do so. Of course, um, deep inside, they must have had the fear that surely we can't have put him through bar school to, to become a pop singer. Yeah? But I never had that kind of in-the-face criticism as such. As a family, were you quite religious or moderate or...? or, or, or? <coughs> I would, what did say, you stand? I would say we were a religious family. Um, it was prayer was embedded into a certain very young age. Uh, my earliest memories of praying uh, was to pray in Jamaat with my father and our three brothers behind, and we would occasionally lead the salah. So this is from a very young age. So yes, uh, a, a religious family. So how did so, he kind of like say, well, music, and then we're quite religious, you know? What, what was that balance like? I mean, I think at the time they probably thought I was just it's a like, temporary phase they, that you're going I through. I was just playing around with the with the concept. But then when I remember sitting um, in the living room with the family watching ZTV and the charts came on uh, and my song had entered in the first entry was at number 18 of the top 20 in the country. So they kind of said to me, "Well, look, at least, you know, you should be happy with that." You know, that's, that's you made it or, yeah. or somewhere on the chart. Yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't a complete waste of time. Okay. And they thought I'd be quite satisfied with that. And that's that done. The following week, um, I remember, again, as a family, we were watching that program. Um, and it passed 18. It wasn't there. 17, it wasn't there. So, okay. It well, disappeared. You know, they were, they were telling me, well, at least you were in the top 20 once. Anyway, 17, 16, 15, 14. And then... Uh, it, I remember it saying, jumping 12 spaces from 18 to number 7, Rizwan Husseini had gone into the top 10. Uh, at this point, I think even the family were a little bit confused. What's going on here? How did that song go from 18 now to number 7? Um, and then the, then we also, again, I'm being consoled, well, look, at least you can say you got into the top 10. Yeah, I think that should be enough for now. They were hoping that would be a closure mm -hmm to this little adventure. The following week, it jumped to number two, right? Uh, this was a shock to me. I was on a train coming back from London and they were watching the program at home and I was listening on the phone and it had jumped to number two. It stayed in number two for about five weeks, never quite got to number one. And then, of course, uh, number one was Bali Sagu at the time. So it was a big competition uh, with him uh, at that time. But... Um, this then followed on, I then did a follow-on album that didn't do um, as well. But, you know, it still, it made money for the record company. Um, and uh, there was supposed to be a third album, which uh, I never did get around to writing because I, I then moved uh, to London in, in 2003. So, so when did you become a police officer? This was actually during my degree. So I, while you were studying law... Yes, I did a foray at uh, Leicestershire Constabulary. Uh, and this was all partly because um, I wanted to practice in criminal law. So uh, I wanted to gain some experience of seeing it from the other side. So that, that was the period, about 18 months, I was part of Leicestershire Constabulary. And what was the process like back then getting into the police? Was, I think, it, was it embraced, like we've got some diversity coming in, or I, was I, this guy I doing remember... Uh, after joining Leicestershire Constabulary, I remember uh, the superintendent had called the local press, the Loughborough Echo, uh, and they had done a piece on when the superintendent 
uh, had was welcoming me, welcoming me to the force because this was a show of diversity. diversity. Um, perhaps even a bit of a token gesture from them to show, hey, look, we've got somebody of ethnic origin uh, in, in the force. But uh, quite surprisingly, and many people won't know this, but there was a time, Loughborough, as a small town as it was, but Tariq Gafur was the superintendent. Okay. You, you may have heard of the name uh, Tariq Gafur. He went on to be very senior uh, uh, in, in the police force. Hey guys, I hope you have been enjoying today's episode of Side by Side with myself, Kazi Shafiqur Rahman, and our special guest, Barista Rizwan Hussein. If you have been enjoying the show, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and, of course, share it with your family and friends. Now, let's get straight back into the show. So, what was life like as a police officer? I mean, did you do some serious kind of chasing? Did you handle any guns? You know, what, was, uh, it, was it exciting <laughs> or was it boring? Or did, they, did the other officers just get you to do all the, you know, their dirty work? You know, you know to be honest, if anybody was to ask <coughs> me, oh, did you chase anybody? There was one occasion in which I uh, had to put my blue lights on in the car and, and speed through town. Um, only one occasion. It's a small town. It's a very sleepy little town, so not much happening. Uh, I remember the first arrest uh, I, I had to had to make, uh, a rather strange one. Um, and then it's not as exciting as you see on the television or the bill as, yeah. as used to come <laughs> yeah. on. Uh, not quite uh, as exciting that. But uh, there were opportunities. For example, uh, the year that I joined, they just introduced the quick cuff, the new handcuffs. Okay. Uh, before it was a dangly one on a, a kind of yeah. the the chain and the yeah thing. yeah, um, and they just introduced the rigid quick cuff. So I remember uh, undertaking training uh, on the quick cuff uh, uh, at that time. We still had batons, yeah, uh, that we would carry. Uh, I remember uh, one of the things that we used to do if we needed to get in touch uh, with somebody at the station, we would go to a phone box. And then use our radio saying, control room, can you please dial me on this number? Wow. Yeah. So they would then call us in this public phone box and we could communicate. We didn't have uh, mobile phones back then. That is crazy. Now, so a lot of people that I know are joining police force forces now recently in, say, Metropolitan Police or, or, or a busy police force like Metropolitan Police. And they end up quitting after like a year or so because they just can't deal with like the stuff that they have to deal with. Like sometimes they're kind of entering houses with someone dead inside it. Yes, Did yes. you ever have to kind of encounter any um, fortunately incidents? Fortunately not. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, deal with uh, any of that situation. Uh, we used to respond to something called sudden death uh, where the cause of the death was unknown. Um, but... Uh, Everything is a sudden death until they're taken to a hospital and a post-mortem is done. So I think on one occasion I did attend to, uh, to a sudden death of an elderly person. What was your worst experience in, in the force? Um, Anything dangerous that you dealt with? Or was it just too quiet no, I, of a town? To, it, to... it was too quiet of a town. I, I, I can't really recall uh, something that would be my worst experience. But I think one of the most trying situations that I went through... Uh, was when I was working as part of the missing from home team. Now, um, when you work as the missing from home team, um, I don't know how much it happens now because of obviously people can be traced and GPS and all of that. But when a teenager used to run away from home, so to speak, um, and I was tasked to look for a particular person who had run away from home uh, of a Muslim family. Um, uh, and then to be able to tell that family where their daughter actually was in the end, it can be a little bit daunting because it's not what they want to hear. So uh, that's probably the most trying thing, to be honest. Nothing, uh, no kind of okay. shootouts or anything. So now, Barrister is one who's saying is generally in our community known through, say, TV stations, you know, your, your role as a presenter, um, your phenomenal performance as a charity fundraiser in TV stations like Channel S. How, so how did you leave all of that behind the, the kind of the barrister degree that you've, do you, did you ever practice 
as, as a lawyer or barrister? Yes, yes, I, I worked as a human rights lawyer for, for a number of years. Uh, I had a, ironically, not many people would know this. Now if you go to Whitechapel, for example, there's hundreds of immigration firms. Yeah. Back in 1997, I, uh, I was a partner in perhaps the only immigration firm in Whitechapel. So now, of course, it's inundate, inundated. So I did a lot of immigration work, a lot of human rights work. I was then employed by uh, the biggest um, government-funded uh, immigration charity called uh, IAS, Immigration Advisory Service. Uh, so I represented, uh, uh, at that time, the Albania-Kosovo conflict was going on. So there was a huge number of uh, asylum seekers entering the country, so I did a lot of human rights and asylum work back then, uh, especially with the Albanian Kosovan community. Did you ever get to wear the wig? Um, only, <laughs> I think, on one occasion, yes. Uh, because a lot, a lot of these um, immigration courts, uh, they're obviously, you're not garbed in, in that particular way. So, Well, and then the chapter of your uh, to my to my knowledge from that's how I know Barrister is one who's saying through the charity activities how yeah. did you kind of um, leave the music life behind acting um, the law um, life as a barrister how did you transition into the charity world well I think um, many people will see that my charity work started some uh, 20 years ago I put that back to even earlier. Uh, this is probably a year before you were born. 1984 was the first fundraiser that I actually did. Uh, I was 11 or 12, and this was for Islamic Relief. Wow. Islamic Relief had just started. Um, no, sorry, not 84. I, I need to correct myself. 88. So you were about three. I was, yeah, yeah. about two, three. In 88, yeah. there was a very, very major flood uh, in Bangladesh. It was one of the worst uh, ever to happen in, in that particular century. And I remember fundraising for Islamic Relief uh, at that time. Um, and uh, in, in fact, organizing an event and fundraising for them. Uh, so yeah, it goes back to that time. So in many respects, uh, uh, back in 2004, I kind of went back to what I was doing uh, many, many years ago. In fact, I had actually personally, uh, as a teenager, I think I was only 17 or uh, 18, registered a charity back then. So you're looking at um, 1992, I actually had my own registered charity. Where are we now? 2024, so wow. a, a long time ago, which was supporting uh, children uh, going to school in Bangladesh with uniform books uh, and tuition fees. This is a long, long time ago. But what happened was I moved to London in 2003. I had kind of transitioned from being a, a lawyer to becoming a law lecturer. So whilst I was working as a lawyer, I took another course at Nottingham Trent University. I did my PGCE, which qualified me as a teacher, and I started teaching A-level law. And that brought me to London, uh, Epping Forest College. Uh, I joined as head of law department. Uh, and then the second year after that, I became deputy head of the uh, of the college um, in 2004. Now, at that time, there was a bit of a, a television revolution going on here in London. Interactive television had just started. The whole novelty and concept of people being being able to call into live television was, wow, you know? People had never been able to do that. And at that time, I was working in some Indian channels uh, doing musical shows, um, and a very, very popular uh, musical show at that time called Do Re Mi, uh, which for those who know Indian music, it was Antakshari. So you sing a line and whatever letter you okay. finish on, somebody else continued. So I was doing that. Um, and then in uh, late 2004, my mother expressed uh, a desire to go to Hajj. Now, uh, both of my brothers were busy, um, so I was the only option to take her to Hajj. Now, for me, that came as a bit of a, uh, a shock because I thought to myself, hey, at that point, I'm on the peak of my music TV presenting, um, you know, very widely known uh, amongst three or four different communities. So for me, how do I go to Hajj? 
So leave everything behind. I and leave then everything behind. But it was my mother's request, and, and uh, I, I had to accept that request. So the earring came out, um, and I remember going to Hajj. Now, that was perhaps a, a very important turning point. The reason is because I remember doing tawaf in Mecca, and there were some people that were pointing me out, oh, has that guy become a Muslim? <laughs> Yeah. Wow. That, it, that must it, have been quite offen- offensive at the same was, time. It was shocking and offensive and quite saddening at the same yeah. time because they thought, yeah, he's that famous guy that does his um, music programs. Has he become a Muslim? MashaAllah. You know. Wow. <laughs> so, that is crazy. Um, and I heard a lot of that. I heard a lot of that in Mecca and Medina. And I remember there was a brother. I, I'm looking for him. I hope he gets in touch with me. It's been, gosh, nearly. Uh, 20 odd years since I've spoken to him, who, who was a part of the Hajj group from Hyde. And I remember sitting with him on my last day uh, after completing Hajj, we went to Medina. And he said to me, Brother, let me tell you something. I've been with you for the last three weeks. One thing I noticed a lot of people know you. Yeah. And that is a ni'mah from Allah. Yeah. Try and go back and use that for a better reason. A lot of people knew you, but for the wrong reason. And I know you felt embarrassed about that sometimes as well. So I remember sitting in Medina, making the intention, Ya Allah, let me go back and exit from this. And wow, that brother's reminder must have been a powerful yeah. reminder for you. Yeah, I remember it to this day, the exact words. And we were sitting just before Maghrib. And I made dua just before Maghrib. I said, Ya Allah, take me back, take me out of this, find me a path that is better for me. And I remember coming back uh, from Hajj, and within a few weeks, I did. Uh, I actually pulled out of my contracts with the Indian Channel, so I stopped these programs. It only took about a month or two. Initially, obviously, I, I had to come back and do the programs. I was contracted to do so. I did pull out of it. And then how did I end up from these Indian channels to Islam Channel? Yeah, remember Islam Channel had just started yeah. at that time. Interesting story there. Obviously... Um, I had come back from Hajj. My sister, the, the one immediately younger than me, her and my brother-in-law were both very much into attending Islamic conferences. Islam Channel at that time were holding their first ever Unity Conference, 2005. GPU? This, oh. was, this is pre-GPU. Okay, okay. Yeah, either 2005 or 2004. This was actually a few months before. That will actually inspire GPU to happen in okay. 2005. So they needed somebody to drive the minibus because none of them were confident in driving a minibus and I was the better driver. And they said, look, would you mind taking us and a group of friends to this conference? There's some big speakers coming to Manchester. So I thought, okay, why not? I'm not doing anything. So I drove them there. They all had tickets. I didn't have a ticket. And I was still thinking, I don't want to go in there because people would say, oh, that guy's become a Muslim. <laughs> yeah. And I remember dropping them, just about to pull out, and there was a brother from Islam Channel who actually noticed me, and he waved at me, oh, brother, please, can you, can you stop? And so I pulled out the window, I said, yes, can I help you? He goes, oh, my, my mum's a really big fan of yours. And I said, okay, alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, how can I help you? He goes, why don't you come into the conference? So I said to him, quite frankly, look, I feel a bit shy because people know me for a different reason. He says, I'll tell you what. Come backstage. You don't have to go in the crowd, but come and sit with us backstage. It'd be a pleasure to have you here. My mum's such a huge fan of yours. So he took me in, and we're around the table about this size, four of us having having lunch. The gentleman next to me is wearing a suit and a hat, and there's some others. So I remember having little conversations with them. And the gentleman next to me asked him, what do you do? He says, oh, I do a bit of da'a work here and there, may Allah accept. Very humble. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> After we finished lunch, this gentleman next to me is the next speaker. And just to show how far I was from the Islamic uh, world, when he went on stage and started speaking, I was so inspired that I asked somebody, I said, who is he? He said, Didn't, the guy you sat next to and had lunch, that's Dr. Zakir Naik. No yeah. way. So I didn't even know who Dr. Zakir Naik was. I had lunch with him before I even knew his name. Wow. I have a picture of that. It's on my phone as well. I'd be happy to share you that. Need to sh- you need to share all these yeah, pictures, yeah. man. We need so, to, we need to um, show the I viewers. remember, I, the first time I listened to Dr. Zakir Naik was behind the curtains. I was backstage. I was dumbstruck, so to speak. I was like, wow. That's what I call power. 
uh, of being able to do thou and change people's lives. And his message, I still remember the words that he was saying on that day. I was, you know, I was quite teary. And I remember saying to the brother who initially called me into the conference, because, you know, brother, I don't know how to thank you for bringing me in and giving me the opportunity to listen to this guy. I'm really inspired. He gave me his card. He said, look, I'm head of sales at Islam Channel. Come in and see us next week. Yeah? Just come and see what the setup we have, etc. I remember going in the, the following week and I met the then head of production, Arfan Ali. And he knew a little bit about my background and he says, come back with an idea for a program because we'd love to have you on our screen. I was like, you want me? He said, well, yeah, you don't do those music shows anymore. Come, you've got experience. Uh, let's try and use that. So I went away sitting at home. I said, look, I've been doing music programs. What do you think I can pull off? And that's when I wrote the program National Karat Competition, NQC. Amazing. Yeah. And I came back to him and he says, this is the program I want to do, NQC. And that was the first ever. And it was the flagship program. I actually did 10 seasons over 12 years uh, on Islam Channel because um, I used to uh, produce it and present it. And at that time, the duo was, here's another big one I'm going to drop, um, for the first three seasons, it was me and Imam Qasim. No way! Yeah, for the first three seasons. Ikra TV! <laughs> yes. Uh, we were very, very close. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless him. He's gone on to do uh, very many great things. Amazing yeah. things, mashallah. But we were the duo. And um, National Karat Competition, which became known as NQC, became the flagship program uh, on Islam Channel. And I ran that program for about 12 years. So a lot of popularity came with that. And then, of course, I was drawn into charity appeals. And then came Bangla, okay? So, <coughs> seeing me present a few appeals on Islam channel, a brother from Burnley, Burnley Islamic Center, Bengali brother, a Bangladeshi brother, he contacted me and said, we're doing an appeal on Channel S, we'd like you to do it. And my response to him was, yes, but I don't speak Bangla. A lot of people will be very shocked that at that time, I couldn't string a sentence together in Bangla, seriously. My parents spoke Sileti at home. We didn't really speak much Sileti amongst the siblings. So if you were to ask me to have a conversation with you, uh, you some people would find it insulting in, the, in how I would uh, pronounce things and even funny. It would be quite comical. So I said to him, but I don't speak. But I said, no, don't worry. Speak as little or as much as you can. And I remember coming on. That was the first appeal I did on uh, Channel S, Burnley Islamic Center. And it was a staggering success. Uh, because ironically, all these viewers were my previous viewers of... Oh, <laughs> yeah, so... Mashallah. Uh, and after that, we kind of came into a relationship. And one person I, I owe it, uh, I'm deeply grateful to, is a brother called Ghulam Rasul. You yes, probably met I him. know Ghulam Rasul. Um, <coughs> and he, when I did my second or third appeal... Mm -hmm. He used to um, whisper it in my ear what to say next sometimes, and I would repeat it. Wow. Um, so um, I think on one occasion he, he was asking, uh, giving another staff some instruction, and I even repeated that. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow, so, funny. But after that, I, I seriously thought, look, if I'm going to be appearing on these Bengali channels, I need to be serious about this. So the next six months I spent watching... Dramas produced in Kolkata, Calcutta, yeah? because that's the purest form of Bangla that you'll get. Uh, fortunately, I could read and write Bangla, and so I started reading newspapers. And I, I actually taught myself to uh, a proficient level within 12 months to speak Bangla. You've heard my Bangla. Um, a lot of people say to me, your Bangla is very good, which I'm, <laughs> still surprises me. Uh, no. It's funny you say that because you say I'm not good with media, but then again you're good with media, and then you say you're not good with Bangla, but then you are good with Bangla. I think I think there's a level of I guess humility, but at the same time I don't know like what it what it is, but but I, I, I would say Bangla was self-taught in twelve months. Mashallah. To a level where I you know I perhaps started thinking in Bangla. You see the I you know how you my idea is how to learn a language 
is you have to think in that language first. Mm, interesting. Never, yeah. never thought so, of it like that. Because if you think in English and try to speak in Bangla, you're going to struggle. Mm, interesting. So, you know what? That's that's a good, so good th- tip. That's where the journey began. And um, of course, time went on. And eight years ago, um, we felt that there was a need for a specific Bangla Dao channel and Hence, TV One was born. Now, before you get to TV One, there's two few in- interesting stories that you have that I need to kind of unpack. Yeah. The first one is your journey in Bangladesh, and on the way back from Bangladesh, something happened at Dhaka Airport in 2008. What happened? Right. So, the 2008 <laughs> episode. You know what? Every April uh, since 2008, every year on the 11th of April, I relive this. Wow. I still relive it because it was a very traumatic time. A couple of things happened at that time. One, of course, the the story in short, I, I've got time to go into length, but the story in short was I was dropping off my sister and brother-in-law uh, to uh, the airport. They were flying back to the UK. We'd all gone to see my father, who was unwell uh, in Bangladesh at that time. Um, and then uh, somebody else from our local town was at the check-in counter she was having some problems. And she said, oh, come and give me a hand. And I was trying to help her communicate with the check-in guy. Um, and at that point, some security guy came up to me and says, well, uh, what are you doing here? Are you trafficking people? <laughs> so, no way. Uh, that's how the conversation started. And then it went on to them trying What to... words did he use? Do you remember? Like in Bangla. Yeah. He must have spoken in Bangla. Do you remember what he said? Yeah. Um, First of all, Abnuna Kachinin, do you know this woman? I said, yeah, she's from my local town. What about the girl that she's traveling with? I said, it must be her daughter or granddaughter. So because of that unclarity, he thought, okay, you don't know them. Okay, yeah. but you're assisting them. Yeah. So, so he asked me, because you know, in, in the communities that we live in, for example, if there's another lady of your mother's age on the same road, you will call her Tatsi yeah. or Kalamma. Yeah. yeah. We, you won't necessarily know her name, no. right? So he asked me, what's her name? I said, I don't know her name. So in his mind, okay, you are helping two people who you don't even know the name, so there's something dodgy here. So he took me to... But in Bangladesh, isn't that what people do? Just help each other in, in the airports? I mean... Well, isn't that what people do anywhere? Or what we should yeah, do? Yeah, exactly, if, if right. Somebody's, and this is somebody of my mother's age. Yeah, She was from Loughborough. She was traveling back from Bangladesh. Um, and I, if I briefly remember what the issue was, that... Because I think it was a granddaughter or a niece that's traveling with you, and you need some kind of a consent letter uh, when it's an unaccompanied minor. Okay. Was well, she that young or something? I, I, I don't know okay. the full. Uh, but um, so the Emirates guy uh, who was at the counter actually said to me, uh, and he testified later as well that this is exactly what happened. He actually said to me, um, his name was Jami Bhai. I still remember his name. He says, I'm really struggling to communicate with this lady. Would you mind just waiting with her for a little while? And then when I'm done with the next passenger, uh, you can help. I said, yeah, no problem. So I was standing there with these people near the counter when I was approached by the security guy. And then taken to their security room. uh, And then literally, very bluntly, accused of people trafficking. Um, At which point I said, look, what are you guys like? Why would I be here? for people trafficking, you know, I'm a qualified barrister from the UK. At at which point they said, do you have your certificate with you? (laughs) (laughs) Of course, we don't carry our certificates uh, with us. They then uh, said, well, look, if you want to leave from here, you need to sign a statement that you uh, entered for the purposes of people trafficking, but you will leave and not return to the airport. So I'm not going to sign anything like that. Uh, Which then went to the... uh, I was then taken to another isolated room in another isolated part of the airport. Uh, and that's where the beating uh, actually happened. So how did the beating initiate? I mean, like there has, there was, I'm sure there was a build up. Did you see what's happening? What's coming? In front of me, a, a, a blank piece of paper and a pen was put. Write your statement, and sign it. Yeah? And when I refused, then it, it, that's how it actually happened at that time because I was refusing to sign a statement that would incriminate myself uh, at that point. And did you see what was happening around you? Like, you know, was there any movements and you know, other, other people getting ready? Or, or was it those guys who were in front of you? It was just those five Air Force officers. Yeah. So um, after that, obviously, um, I'd suffered uh, a, a, a fracture of, of my 
left leg and my right arm. So, so when, do you remember how long you were there for in in the airport? I I remember uh, briefly that my brother and uh, my sister and brother-in-law had gone in, uh, gone inside around about two o'clock in the afternoon, and then the next time I was able to check my watch was around about five o'clock in the afternoon. So three hours when when I was left outside the airport in the loading area. No way. It's, yeah. Um, um, obviously, I couldn't walk properly because one leg was broken, arm was broken. So I called my driver uh, at that so time. So you had your phone at least? Yeah, I had my phone. Called my driver to come and pick me up. Uh, he then picked me up, knew, could see that my clothes was torn, etc. Um, I was immediately taken to... Uh, ironically, that day, uh, 11th of April, was uh, the Boishaki Day in Bangladesh. So there were people all over the roads. So even navigating through that was difficult. Um, they took me to a clinic... Um, uh, my arm and my leg was immediately put into a cast. Um, it was already too late that night to travel back to my home in Hobbygunj at that time. Uh, I remember a very well-known community figure, uh, Shagir Farooq Bakht, came to see me at the, at the hotel. I was actually in a wheelchair uh, that evening uh, before uh, traveling back. And it was at that time that he actually also advised me that you need to inform uh, people in the UK because this is really not on um, and I contacted uh, Channel S so I sent them the pictures of the bruising uh, and where the beating uh, had taken place and then I think things kicked off here a bit in the UK because by the time I'd arrived there were a number of camera crew at, at Heathrow Airport um, and also the following day I think there was a demonstration at a London Muslim Centre with over 3,000 people that had attended. So, so how long was, was, after how long did you arrive in London? I had to be emergency flown out by the British Embassy within 24 hours of the incident. No way. Because they were concerned of my safety. Because uh, it had already been highlighted to the British Embassy and they were already investigating, um, the, the fear was that I may not get out. So I had to be emergency flown out. So. Wow. So, um, <laughs> this is mad. Yeah. W w what do you think? And obviously, we've read on newspapers that these people were kind of put into prison. And I don't know if they yeah, came the, out or not. If the, the trial took place uh, some few months later. Uh, there was initially uh, a lot of um, requests for me to go back to Bangladesh. Uh, at the time, Stephen Timms uh, was a minister at the time. He was advising that until we get assurances from the Bangladesh government, of your safety, you can't go. Eventually, they gave uh, their assurances that I would go. Um, a, a representative from the British High Commission would be present. Two representatives from the UK would travel with me uh, as I went for court martial, um, uh, the actual trial that took place. Um, I just want to very, uh, because again, there's so much detail, but one thing uh, at that time, you see, social media can be a very crazy thing. And I still think the most dangerous thing that we have in today's society is social media because so many people can write so many things. At that time, some person wrote on social media that he's actually not a barrister. And I'm quite sure that's why they beat him up. Now, he also provided evidence to that effect. Going, wow. How did he do that? Well... <clears throat> this person went to the extent of calling the Bar Council to ask whether they, you have a barrister on your register by the name of Rizwan Hussein. And the reply they got in an email was no. Now you're going to ask me, how's that? Rizwan Hussein is my screen name, the yeah. name I use on television. I have a first name and a second name, which they obviously didn't know. I'm not going to mention my first name yeah. because I don't like to uh, hmm. <laughs> talk about it. It's a bit of an odd one. Um, so they did this inquiry using Rizwan Hussein is actually my surname it's a double barreled mm. surname it's not my first name and last mm. name so obviously the bar council is going to come back and say nope we don't have anybody on that mm. record he put those those emails onto the social networks um, and 
Somehow. But what was you trying to achieve, like by doing that, by proving that you were you were not a barrister? I don't know. But the interesting twist in this is that the uh, the defence lawyers of those Air Force officers got hold of that, and that was going to be their main case when I went to Bangladesh. As how? Like, uh, what as were in, they going to say? Uh, as in, this man he came uh, to to the airport, threw his weight around. Uh, claiming to be a barrister, but we have proof that that was fake. That's why you got beaten. The justification. Wow. So, um, so you went to Bangladesh. I Did you present Bangladesh. yourself in in the court as a barrister? Myself. Look, I am yeah. here. I yeah. am. Well, the thing is, they were extremely confident because the opening statement of their defence lawyer was uh, to the panel, Your Honour, this is an open shut case. This will only take a few minutes. I only have two questions to ask, Mr. Rizwan and say. I'm thinking, wow, what evidence do they have against me? So he looked at me and said, Mr. Rizwan Hussain, which year were you called to the bar as a barrister? Mm -hmm. So I said, this year. And then he smiled and he said, do you have a certificate? I produced my certificate. (laughs) That must have been funny. And you could see the shock and horror uh, on his face because he didn't know what to do. That was then sent to the desk. Uh, of the panel, the five judges uh, representing the Air Force. They all looked around, it had the proper Lincoln's Inn seal being called to the bar of Lincoln's Inn, and it had my full name on. All of a sudden, it felt like their defense lawyer had nothing else to say because that was his case open shut. Because he thought he's going to prove That's it. there's no certificate, you're a liar, the beating is justified. Yeah? So then the judges turned around and looked at the defense. Well, you said it was an open shut case. What do you want to say now? Uh, what, where are you going with this? And he said, so, so can I look at the certificate? So, <laughs> so he looked at the certificate and he says, is that your full name? And I said, well, look, before this trial, uh, the court requested a copy of my passport. You have a copy of my passport. My name is clearly on the passport. Did you not cross check that before you make this question? And I then asked to address the judges as your honors. I want to tell you where this comes from because some fool somewhere decided to go and do this inquiry using Mm -hmm. half my name and got a negative answer. And this lawyer here took this as factual evidence. The, the, The case finished there and then because the judges, they asked the lawyer, do you have anything else to say in the defense of your clients? And the lawyer said no. So what was the outcome? The outcome was they were all sentenced to prison in varying degrees, seven years, four years, three years, uh, and in one case, two years. But there was a fifth guy of the five that were accused that I remember just kept watch. He was the guy standing outside the door. And uh, I remember doing his defense in court. Uh, I remember standing up and saying to the judges, Your Honor, he was actually not a part of the beating. He just watched the door. So he only got a very short three-month or six-month sentence. Did you have a verify or did you check, like, did they actually do the time or, or, or were they released? Um, you know? I think for me, um, once that case was over, I was just relieved. Um, you just wanted to kind of move on with your life? Uh, very much so, because it was, the reason why it's a traumatic time, because we had gone to Bangladesh to visit my father. The incident happened... And then my father actually passed away 28 days later. And, <clears throat> and I was unable to attend his janazah even for security reasons. So um, for me, that was even bigger for me than going through this torture that I did in Malaz, the fact that I was unable to attend uh, uh, the janazah. So after kind of you moved past it, maybe a year on, like, did you ever reflect thinking like, why did it happen? Like, what was the motivation? What triggered these guys? You know, was there, a, was there an ulterior motive? You know, you can't just come and beat someone up. I mean, look, it's, it's coming up to how many years would it be now? 16 years ago now? Uh, I still, even now, if I was to fly to Bangladesh tomorrow, I'm in a rush to get out of the airport because it holds a lot of trauma uh, for me. Um, if, if my drive is 10 minutes late, I'm literally Panicking. frantic. Because when I go there, obviously, what I went through for those 40, 50 minutes of beating, I didn't think I was going to live to, to see the day. Yeah? So even now, 16 years old, 
uh, I feel very, very uncomfortable uh, when I'm at uh, Antaka Airport, even now. And did you ever come to your own conclusion, like, you know, what, what must have been going through the, 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 the beaters' minds? Like, I think, like, to beat someone up, you know, an international person, it's not a small deal. Well, I, th- I think what it is, look, there was history. Remember, um, a, a British national was killed at that airport. And this was a few years before my incident. And there were incidents where they've gotten away with it for so many times. This was another run-of-the-mill beating. Who's going to know? But unfortunately, they picked on... The wrong guy. The wrong guy. Um, uh, and I think what this did, it did highlight it to a certain extent that even Bangladesh has felt embarrassed that this is... And, and it did bring about some positive change, uh, although I think we're still a long way to go in terms of bribes that are often openly requested, even now uh, in, in Dhaka. And, uh, but for me, uh, that airport will forever perhaps remain uh, as a place of trauma. Wow, that is, that is absolutely madness. And when was the last time have you been to Dhaka or through Dhaka Airport? Yeah. Well, after that, I mean, for, for a good few years, I didn't go back. Um, what was your most recent visit? Um, and most recent visit, uh, I, I went last year. But, but since that incident, I've been about 20, 30 times. Do you ever say, you know what, I don't want to fly through that airport. I would rather go to Silet or something. Or, or, or is that a thing in your mind? Is that kind of... Yeah, I mean, my preference is, of course, if I'm working in Silet at that time, is to go straight to Silet. Um, or, uh, well, that's the only second alternative, really. Yeah. Uh, but for me, if I have to fly to Dhaka, then I, I, I just do it now. But I don't spend much time in the airport. I, I like to be out really quickly. So and after I, I that incident... I don't know how to explain it, because it's like going back to your own torture chamber. Yeah. Uh, so are you still a proud Bangladeshi even after all of that happened? Or, absolutely, or, absolutely. Look... Uh, how not, do you kind of classify this incident? Look, my own people did that to me without knowing any reasons, you know... I just, remember giving a lot of TV interviews at that time. I said, look, this is not a representation of Bangladesh. This is... Uh, uh, a few people that felt that they were above the law, uh, their uniform was above the law, and sadly they brought, they brought disrepute to the country. This is not a reflection of what Bangladesh is. Bangladesh, you know, yes, unfortunately what tends to get highlighted is, I, I remember, I'll, I'll give you an incident, very recently I went to Bangladesh with a very uh, famous singer who actually uh, knows you really well because you inspired him uh, to do a nasheed, Mevlan Kurti Oh, wow. Yeah? Wow. yeah, I remember sitting with him and he said, oh, do you know Kazi? And I said, who's that? And he said, I was doing this song, Allahu Allah, and he inspired me to do that nasheed. Anyway. Wow, small amazing, world, amazing. It? Wow, yeah. Mevlan is, 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 yeah. is, is content. So I took, I took Mevlan to, to Bangladesh. Wow. Um, I remember he, um, him saying to my brother Abid, like, yeah. oh, I'm in Bangladesh, I'm on a tour, and that's why he couldn't come to... Was it around August time or something? Yes, yes, yes. So, so I, yeah, Abid was getting married and... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I remember um, taking Mevlan there, but unfortunately, his first two hours experience of Dhaka was awful uh, at the airport. He was um, made to wait for a long time. The officers were very rude to him because he, he needed a visa on arrival. And his first impression was, why are people in Dhaka like this? I said, look, this is not a representation of this country. These are just some of these officers. But that's the most recent experience. Wow. So, now, this is something that you might want to talk about or not talk about, but I did ask for your permission. So you said you're happy to talk about anything. Yeah. Your marriage with Nadia Ali, the BBC presenter. How did he, I mean, just... Quickly, without getting into too much detail, just give us a kind of insight in, ton- in terms of how did it come about and how did it kind of end? Um, I, th- I think how it came about, obviously, um, the, the marriage was an arranged marriage. Um, uh, although we knew each other before uh, that marriage, uh, she was a student for a year uh, at the college that I taught at, uh, but it was towards the end of her course that I'd actually uh, joined the course. I know that's going to sound really odd now. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, but anyway. Uh, but, but then again, she was in Channel Less. You yes, were in Channel Less. One yeah. would assume, do you know what, this is where it all yeah, happened. I think, look, at that time, 
You see, Allah plans for us. Perhaps it was a part of our life's design that we were to be married um, uh, for a while. And uh, perhaps also the, uh, the part of our life that we were not to be married uh, uh, after that period. And uh, uh, in... If I, if I reflect on that period, it was a difficult period, I'm sure, for both of us uh, at that time. But we have, you know, both moved on. Uh, she's very happily married with a, uh, with a child. I've got, yes. I've got two boys. So every, every chapter in our life is a, is a learning experience. At what point did you think, you know what, yeah, this is going to be a tough one. And, you know, it's not going the way that we anticipated, both of you. I, I think... Uh, in retrospect, and I say this to, to her credit, I think uh, she tried very hard uh, uh, in the marriage. I think for me, perhaps I, I still wasn't ready uh, to be married, I think. At um, what age are we talking? I was in my 30s, but I, I think, you know, you know where it is. Um, I would still say I was still quite immature when it came to settling down as a family man uh, at that time. So, so what was her problem with you? Like, what is it that you annoyed her with? I don't want to go into too much uh, detail about that, but uh, um, I think that marriage fell apart because of my own doing, uh, more than anything else. Uh, so um, she, she tried her best in that marriage, um, but unfortunately, it is what it is. If we could go back and change things, uh, which isn't... Impossible. As Impossible. We um, who knows uh, what the situation would have been? But I, if if you were to ask whose fault uh, was it, then it would it would be down to me. Uh, wow, well, that's that's um, well. I guess uh, you know. I don't want to dress it up. Yeah. Sometimes, look, you, you get to a point in life where you've got to admit that you you were wrong, and you've got to also admit that we are not infallible as human beings. We're not. Uh, we're not angels, we're not uh, perfect human beings. We are susceptible to making mistakes. And I think the, the importance or, or the good that comes out of that, I, I can never say mistakes are good, they're not. But if you can extract a learning from it, then... What do you think you've taken away from, from that, I guess, failure in, in the marriage? Um, look, every, every failure gives you the opportunity Absolutely. To, to reflect on that. It gives you the opportunity to move on uh, and not make the same mistakes again. You see, um, even the Prophet ﷺ uh, uh, advised against falling in the same hole twice. Yeah. Yeah. So th there is, there is um, th a positive from it, but at the same time, we, we can't overlook the fact that there was a period of suffering for both parties concerned. Um, and we can, only, um, uh, we can only seek forgiveness from Allah for that period. So what would be, a, I mean, is there anything that you do differently now in, in, your, in your, mashallah, now successful marriage? Is, I mean, have you changed? I'm older. Okay. I, I, I think age is a, is a very big fact. I'll tell you, look, in the Bangladeshi community, um, there is a tendency that there is a kind of an age for marriage, right? Yeah. Um, from and now people, this is becoming more and more kind of like yeah. It's, well, it's I mean, if you look at in, more prominence, like in, oh, in, in contrast, this guy is so old and this girl is so young, or, or vice versa. Yeah, I don't look. There, there is no age uh, for marriage. Uh, I think there's got to be a a maturity uh, to be able to take on the responsibility. Of another person's life, you know, of another person's daughter, um, and if that maturity is not there, then you're certainly not ready. I'll give you a contrasting view. My my brother, immediately older than me, just a year older than me, he got married when he was eighteen. Alhamdulillah, very successful marriage. I mean, if, gosh, if we look at it now, he's been married for over thirty years. Mashallah. His, his daughter is May Allah now, bless him. His daughter is now married. He's got a son-in-law. Uh, that worked for him. Yeah. So. Not every formula works for everybody. So, you know, there is this um, view, um, I guess, mainly in social media or in the younger kind of uh, generations. And I know these, these clips will go on TikTok and, and Reels. When it's a guy, a guy, older guy marrying a younger girl is somewhat 
an offense, but then again, when it's the other way around, it's not a problem. Well, uh, age is only a number. Well, the thing is, uh, let's look at it very frankly. The Sunnah uh, of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He married somebody fifteen years senior to him. Yeah, um, we seem to be okay with getting married to somebody fifteen years junior to us, but the other way, it, it seems to be an issue. These are cultural stigmas. They have nothing to do with Islam or, or, or what our beliefs are. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at society now, there are so many uh, sisters who are now in their late 40s um, or, or mid 40s are uh, unmarried, um, unable to find a husband, and the stigma makes it worse. Or perhaps is it because they've been missold by the feminism movements, feminism ideologies, you know, independence, and st- which is okay, fine. Everyone is equal as a human being in their own rights, but there well, is definitely an imbalance, question. right? Was uh, the mother of believers, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, a feminist? Were the great uh, mothers uh, uh, of that time, the, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa were they feminists? In fact, there was no need for feminism because in Islam, women were respected to a level that no other religion could equate to that. There wasn't a need for it. So if we focus on what Islam teaches us with regards to respect, uh, respecting women, then you, you will find that there isn't a need for feminism. Interesting, interesting view. Now, let's wrap it up with uh, TV One. Of, of course, it's a business venture um, in its own right. Um, how did that come about? Uh, and I know it is with Gulam Rasul Bai, who you are hugely inspired by, and you kind uh, and, of and mentioned. Sheikh Madani. Sheikh Sheikh Madani. Um, how is that going? And um, I know um, you started off very nicely, you know, very nice built studio. Yeah. Um, as a business, how is it going? Well, the thing is, um, we have seen a dramatic uh, revolution of television in the last 20 years. Uh, it went to a point where it started 20 years ago when interactive television and live programming started. It was a novelty. Um, and all of a sudden, people could connect with TV and programs, etc. It went through its particular peak. And then, of course, social media has grown hugely in the yeah. last decade. Uh, and now, uh, TV is no longer the central focus in a household. If you sit with some five people in the same living, they're all looking at their device. Yeah. Very rarely uh, would you sit to say, it's eight o'clock, a program is coming on to yeah. watch it. It's all on demand. It's all about when it's convenient for me. Uh, and content, um, people's concentration span is down to 60 seconds now. Yeah. So TikTok and Instagram Reels are, are more of a popular choice. Yeah. Uh, in my house, for example, I've got two young ones. Um, it's YouTube all the time. They're watching their YouTube Omar shorts and, Hannah and, and yeah, whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. So don't get to. Uh, I mean, even as an owner of a TV channel, I don't get to watch TV at home. You know, I don't think. Can't remember the last time I switched to channel seven eight one to watch TV one. It's just so I, I can pretty much appreciate that's probably the case in many many households. However. There is uh, an aging population that still um, watch TV amongst the Bangladesh community. And there is also a constant flow of uh, migrant Bangladeshis coming in, students Mm. coming in, that still connect with um, a a Bengali language television channel. I still think maybe we've got about five years left in in television. How are you guys evolving into kind of... I mean, to take more um, advantage of, say, the likes of YouTube, where YouTube rewards you for, for making contents. I mean, how far are you guys in terms of just kind of switching? Yeah, I think... Or are you going to switch at all? Yeah, we, we are evolving with time, but not at the speed that I'd like it to. Um, but that evolution that we're going through has also got to be paced because that you, if, for example, we suddenly went online now, then there are people of my mother's age that still do watch TV. Yeah. You're going to cut them off. Yeah. So even though we'd like to move quicker uh, with the technology, we've got to hold back a little bit and say, so we're trying to move on a kind of a parallel. Uh, what are your challenges as, as a TV channel, you know, being in Muslim, perhaps Bengali-focused space? What, what are the challenges? I think the, the whole relevancy uh, issues uh, is our biggest threat at the moment. Are we still going to be relevant 
in five years' time. Is, uh, for example, for Dawa at one time, I remember going out and buying CDs of Sheikh Ahmed Didat or VHS tapes, yeah. not CDs, VHS tapes of Sheikh Ahmed Didat to listen to his lecture um, back in the days. Yeah. Uh, now, Dawa is delivered in 60 seconds on TikTok. Yeah. How more relevant will we remain as a 24 hour Dawa channel in five years' time? Is there a need for that in five years' time? That's the big question. Wow. So that moves you moves us nicely to the ending of the show where I have a question for you, which is your, your current education. You're doing a PhD in artificial intelligence. I mean, what are you planning to use that for? Right. Again, uh, I found that, in fact, um, the, the pandemic was a useful time for a lot of us. We could focus on things that we hadn't focused on. Uh, I had two kids uh, at that time. In fact, three. One passed away. In early life. Um, and then um, the, the funniest thing is, in my life, in the last 20 years, I enrolled on about six different master's programs and never completed any of them. I would get excited. Yeah, I'm going to start this master's. And I got busy. During this pandemic time, I actually completed a master's. Whilst completing that master's, I did a dissertation on uh, the influence of online mechanisms in decision making. So in the future, could we have artificial intelligence jury members that are making that decision? So I finished the master's at City University. And then um, in at this age, when you've got a family, to venture into academia, you need a lot of support. And my wife encouraged me as well, look, if you want to do it, just do it. Uh, you know, you've always talked about, you wish you did a PhD, so do it. So I went through the, a very rigorous application process. Um, I'm currently at Anglia Ruskin University. My, and my master's is about, now imagine in the future, your case is going to be dealt with by an, an AI judge. Wow. Right? It might be but, more fair. <laughs> <laughs> but you say that, right? It might be more fair. But the person who wrote that program has inherent prejudices. Mm, yeah, yeah, true. So what I, what my research is going to look into is how do we deal with algorithmic bias and prejudice in AI legal systems? Well, that's... So how do you take a bias out of a programmer? That's deep. That's deep. Yeah. Now, so. let's end the show with a um, few quick fire questions. As short as possible, the answer should be... Um, your favorite childhood memory? My favorite childhood memory. I've got so many. Um, your maybe, favorite one? My favorite, favorite, favorite memory has got to be. Oh gosh, <laughs> too many. <laughs> Scoring a hat trick. Yes. How did that feel? I never thought ever. I was awful at football, but one lunchtime we were all playing on the field at my primary school, and I actually scored a hat trick. Wow, yeah. wow. And the last book you read? The last book I read is a book called uh, Lion. Um, it's been made into a movie recently. It's about a child uh, that gets lost at the age of five by falling asleep on a train and then gets up, uh, ends up being adopted and taken to Australia. So, Ganesh Tali. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah Ganesh Talai. Yes, the, the, yeah, yes, man, yeah, yeah. That, that movie made I, me I, cry. I, I, I found that very inspirational and very deep. Yeah, and yeah. apparently it's a true story as well. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching the movie. Man, yeah. it's going to make you cry. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite used emoji? Uh, the, the tongue out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. And if you could travel in time, where would you go first? I would, uh, I'd rewind maybe 30 years, going back to when I had just graduated and make some good decisions at that time. What would those decisions be? I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Yeah, I think one of my childhood heroes was Indiana Jones. So I probably would be in archaeology or either that or in performing arts, perhaps. Well, Barrister Rizwan Hussein, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and I hope our viewers of Side by Side podcast have enjoyed. And I look forward to continue our conversation offline, inshallah. So thank you for making the time and coming over. Uh, it was enjoyable having this conversation. In fact, uh, you made me 
relive a lot of things. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. Barakallah. And that's it for today. I hope you have enjoyed our today's episode of Side by Side with myself Kazi Shafiqur Rahman and our special guest Barista Rizwan Hussein. If you have any questions for our guest, don't forget to comment below and if you have any guest request or any guest that you would like to see on your screen, then comment below. Hit the subscribe button and share it with your family and friends. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah